Hello and welcome to another NGen Math 8 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler and today we're going to be doing Unit 6, Lesson 8 on more work with lines of best fit. In the last lesson, we looked at creating scatter plots and then really kind of eyeballing the line that goes through the data that has roughly the same slope as the data and also has about the same number of points above the line of best fit as it does below the line of best fit. Right Now, again, this is really kind of an art, if you will. This is kind of eyeballing it. Um, in Algebra 1, you'll use graphing calculators and the technology of a graphing calculator to actually come up with the equation and the graph of the line of best fit. For now, the best that we can do is either try to do it, you know, kind of eyeballing it ourselves, or if we're given a plot and the line of best fit sort of interpreting what that line tells us. So we're going to do more of that today. You will want your calculator handy because equations of lines of best fit can be kind of ugly. I'll be honest with you. Let's get into them right now. All right, here we go. Exercise number one. A company has developed a diet plan that includes exercising. They would like to study the association between the number of hours exercising and the weight loss due to the diet. They have 50 test subjects follow the diet as well as record the number of hours they spend exercising over a three week period. The scatter plot below shows the results for each of the 50 participants along with the line of best fit. Letter A. What does the best fit line predict the weight loss of a person who exercises for 14 hours? So let's just be very clear about something. The reason that people want to do this is they want to be able to predict you know, something, right? In this particular study, they'd like to be able to predict the amount of weight that a person loses if they follow this diet plan and if they've exercised a particular amount, right? So the data is all over the place, right? Some people exercise more, some people exercise less. You know, generally speaking, it looks like that the more the person exercises, the more weight they, they lose on this diet plan. That makes a lot of sense. The question in letter A was, how much does the line of best fit not the data itself, but the line of best fit predict a person will lose if they exercise for 14 hours. Pause the video now and see if you can come up with that. And again, we're not talking about these data points up here that are near the 14 hour mark. I literally mean if you come over here to 14, you go to the line of best fit and you come over here, it looks like it predicts 11 pounds, right? And again, that's why we want lines of best fit. We want to be able to predict them. We want to be able to say to somebody, hey, if you follow this diet plan and you exercise for 14 hours, you're going to lose 11 pounds. Now, obviously, you know, there was somebody who exercised around 14 hours and lost more than 11 pounds, but the line itself predicts 11 pounds for 14 hours. Now, let's take a look at letter B. Estimate the y-intercept of the best fit line. Give an interpretation of the y-intercept within the context of this problem. Fantastic. Well, we've got the line of best fit drawn. Let me just kind of move this up a bit so we don't have to look at all that text. I'd like you to try to estimate the y-intercept of this line as best as you can. And then I'd like you to give me an interpretation of it within the context of this problem. Pause the video now. Well, it's a little bit tricky, but what I can say is that it lands somewhere between two and three, and oftentimes when that's the case, I'm just going to go two and a half, all right? Is it exactly two and a half? Probably not, right? But we're going to go two and a half. Now, what, how do we interpret that within the context of this problem? Well, right, the y-intercept always tells us the y-value when the x-value is zero. The x in this case is the total time exercising. So basically this y-intercept is saying if you spend no hours exercising on this diet plan, you will still lose two and a half pounds. So let's write that down. If you spend, and here I'll even go a little bit better, zero hours exercising on this diet plan, you will 
will still lose 2.5 pounds. Now, if you said that you estimated the y-intercept to be two pounds, that's great. I think uh, three pounds would be a little bit weird. But, and then you interpret it as, hey, if you spend zero hours exercising, you'll still lose two pounds. That's completely okay. All right, now we've got the y-intercept. That's pretty easy to do, but of course lines really are dictated by two things. They're dictated by their y-intercept and by their slope. So that's what we're gonna get into next. Let's take a look at letter C. Circle two points that the best fit line passes through and write their coordinates below. These do not need to be actual data points and likely aren't. All right, so we know, right, from our, our work with linear, you know, just equations of lines, that to calculate the slope of a line, I need two points that it falls through. So now, if I would like the slope of this line, what I wanna do is I wanna look really closely along the line and try to find two points that, lo that this line passes through. Now, how about this? Let's do one of them kind of in common, and let's actually use maybe the one that we just looked at. In other words, let's use the point 14 comma 11, right? That was that one that said, if I exercise for 14 hours, I'll lose 11 pounds. What I'd like you to do is try to find a point down in this area that this best fit line goes through. And again, it doesn't have to go through a data point, all right? We just wanna look along the line to see where it goes through sort of a, a nice point that I, I know that, it, that it's hit. Pause the video now and try to come up with another point. All right, so it's a little bit tricky, right? But I feel like this point right here, which is really at six comma six, right? So six hours of exercising corresponded to six pounds of weight loss on this line, all right? Now, if you chose a different point, that's perfectly okay. Remember, the slope of a line should not depend on the two points that we pick right? It shouldn't depend on those. But generally speaking, if you are trying to find the slope of a best fit line, it's best to actually find two points that are relatively widely spaced out. Now let's take a look at letter D. Find the slope of the line that passes through the two points in C. Express your answer as a decimal rounded to the nearest tenth. All right. Well, what I'd like you to do is find the slope of the line that passes through these two points or that passes through this point and whatever other point you found, okay? Now remember, the slope formula, just as kind of a, kind of a reminder, is the change in y divided by the change in x, which is y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. So go ahead and use that formula to come up with the slope. Now I know that we've normally expressed our slopes as fractions, but here I actually want it as a decimal and I just want it rounded to the nearest tenth. Go ahead and do that. All right, well, I'll consider this x1, y1. I'll consider this x2, y2. Makes sense. So I'm gonna say my slope, maybe move this one. Move this down a little bit, give myself a little more room. My slope is going to be 11 minus six divided by 14 minus six, and that's gonna be five eighths and again, if we were just kind of coming up with the slope of a, of a line and we didn't care about it in any other way, I think I'd leave it as 5 eighths. I want it in decimal form, so I'm just going to do 5 divided by 8 on my calculator. That's going to be 0 0.625, which if I round to the nearest tenth is 0 0.6. Now, if you chose a different second point than I did, so you didn't use 6, 6 here, you still should have a slope that's very, very close to that. If you got a slope that's very different, and by very different I mean it could be like if you got a slope of 0.3 or 0.9 or something like that, then I'd go back and look at that point that you chose. It's probably you, you read it off wrong. Your slope should be 0 0.5, 0 0.6, or 0.7 at worst, and most likely it should be 0.6. All right, now let's interpret that slope. Take a look at letter E. Using proper units, give an interpretation of the answer you found in D. 
All right, let's talk about this. This is extremely important. You're oftentimes asked to interpret the slope and the y-intercept of a best fit line. The y-intercept tends to be pretty easy. It's just, you know, what is the y-value when the x-value is zero? Slope is always a rate, right? It's always a ratio of change. Now, let's take a look at it in terms of, of units because the units will help us interpret the slope. Right, the units of the numerator were the units of y, and those were pounds, right? And the units of the denominator were hours exercising. I want to just put hours x there. So this 0 0.6 now has units of pounds per hour exercising. Now you have to be a little bit careful though with your interpretation. It would be easy at this point to just say for every hour that a person exercises they lose an additional 0 0.6 pounds. All right, But that's not exactly, or they lose 0 0.6 pounds. That's not exactly how we want to interpret it because with no hours of exercise, you lose two and a half pounds. It's always for every additional blank, you get an additional blank. So here's what I mean. Let me just keep that on the screen. For every additional hour of exercise, a person loses an additional 0 0.6 pounds. All right, you really can't say for every hour they exercise they lose 0 0.6 pounds. All right, because that would mean if you didn't exercise at all, you, should, you shouldn't lose any weight. And yet we saw that somebody who exercised zero hours still lost two and a half pounds. So that's where it's very important to say for every additional hour of exercise, a person loses an additional 0 0.6 pounds. Finally, letter F, this should be a piece of cake. Write the equation of the best fit line in y equals mx plus b form. All right, well, we've got everything we need here. Pause the video now and go ahead and write the equation of the best fit line. All right, well, we know in the equation of a line, right, the number that's multiplying x is the slope, and the plus b is the y-intercept. So it's as simple as just saying this. y equals 0.6x plus 2.5. Now, you might have a different slope and a different y-intercept if your answers to the slope and the y-intercept question were different. But again, the equation should be roughly that. All right. Okay, let's take a look at some more lines of best fit. Just as with previous linear function models, the y-intercept is always the starting output value, and the slope is the unit rate the output is changing compared to a unit change in the input. That's that whole, for every one unit of increase in this, we get blank units of increase in that. All right, so let's take a look at a problem with a negative association. Exercise number two. Researchers wanted to study the association between a person's age and the number of hours they slept per night. The researchers collected data from 100 subjects, which is shown in the scatter plot below, along with the line of best fit. The researchers found that the line of best fit had the equation y equals negative 0.08x plus 12.25. Letter A, how many hours of sleep does the model predict a person who is 50 years old will get? Show how you found your answer. All right, well, here's your equation. It is the model for this data. So use that model to predict how much sleep a person's gonna get if they're 50 years old. Pause the video now. Well, keep in mind that the age is the x variable, right? So basically what we're being told in this situation is that x is equal to 50 and we want the value of y. 
Well, that's sort of the whole point of the model, right? The model tells us that the amount of sleep that a person gets is going to be negative 0.08 times 50 plus 12.25. And we're going to just put this all in at once. We do not want to do this in stages. I'm going to do negative 0.08 times 50 plus 12.25 and we get 8.25 hours. In other words, according to this model, somebody who is 50 years old will typically sleep 8 and 1 quarter hours a night. And it is generally true that as people get older, they tend to sleep less at night. Now, let's do some interpretation. In letter B, right, it says, how do you interpret the values negative 0.08 and 12.25 within the context of this problem? Okay, well, one of these two values is the slope and one of these two values is the y-intercept. I'd like you to try to use those ideas, what we just talked about in the last problem, to try to interpret both. And if you feel more comfortable interpreting this positive number first, go ahead and do that. I think that's how I'll start my explanation. And then move on to this. If you can only figure out how to interpret one of them, that's fine as well. But try your best to give an interpretation of both of those two numbers. All right, well, let's start with the 12.25, right? The 12.25 is the y-intercept of this line. And really, what that's telling us is that a newborn baby will sleep 12.25 hours per night, right? Somebody who is zero years old, right? Because that's what the X is, right? The X is how old they are. Somebody who's zero years old, a newborn baby, will sleep 12.25 hours per night. There's your y-intercept. Now, your slope, right? Well, let's talk about the units of the slope. The units of the slope will always be the y units per x units, right? So, let's just be very clear. That's negative 0.08 hours per year, right? Now, how do we interpret that? Again, I, I, you know, it's a little tricky, but here's where you always want to go, right? Means that for every year, a person ages, they need point no, notice I'm leaving the negative off, 0 0.08 hours per night less sleep. All right. Or you could say for every year that a person gets older, they, you know, the amount of sleep they, they need goes down by 0 0.08 hours per night, right? Um, or the amount of sleep per night that they need goes down by 0.08 hours, right? They need less sleep by 0.08 hours for every year that a person gets older. Isn't that kind of cool? So it's literally the whole like rise run business. I go a year this way, I go down 0.08 hours. I go a year this way, I go down 0.08 hours. For every year that passes, the amount of sleep that a person needs goes down by 0.08 hours. That simple. Not that that's that simple, but you know, that's how we interpret slopes. Whoops, well that didn't happen. Let's try that again. There we go. Let's take a look at one more exercise. Exercise number three. A fishing group wants to see the association between the length of a rainbow trout and its weight. They measure the lengths and weights of 200 trout with the results shown in the scatter plot below, along with the line of best fit and its equation. Letter A, if a person catches a rainbow trout that is two feet long, how many ounces should they expect it to be? 
right? And this would be kind of a nice model. You know, you can imagine being out in a fishing boat or something and you, you catch a rainbow trout. And maybe you don't have something that can weigh it, right? Um, but you do have a ruler and apparently you have this equation along with a calculator. <laughs> Right? So, right, you, you take this equation, you throw in how long the trout is in inches, and this thing will then give you how much it weighs in ounces. So, letter A, if a person catches a rainbow trout that's two feet long, how many ounces should they expect it to be? Little warning here, watch your units on the length. Pause the video now and see if you can predict how much that two foot long trout, that's a big trout, how much it's going to weigh. Well, you have to be careful because even though they kind of gave us the X value, the X values are the length of trout in inches, inches. So if you plug two into this formula, and let me put that formula up here a little bit bigger so that you can see it, 7.3 times X plus 1.5, right? If you put two into this equation for X, you're really predicting how much a trout will weigh if it's two inches long. That's a tiny looking trout, you know, I mean, that's like a, that's, that's a dinky thing. So I need two feet, but of course, two feet, right, is going to be equal to 24 inches. And this is what I need to put in for X. So Y is going to be 7.3 times 24 plus 1.5. Right, so I'll just bring this thing up, do a little 7.3 times 24 plus 1.5 gives me a weight of 176.7 ounces. All right. Now, letter B. Explain the significance of the 7.3 in the model. So what does the 7.3 tell you? Pause the video now and see if you can answer that. All right, well the 7.3 in this case is the slope, right? So again, let's take a look at units. 7.3 what? Well, the units of the, num of the, of the top or of the Y value are ounces and the unit of the x are inches, 7.3 ounces per inch, right? So what does that really tell you? What it tells you is that for every additional inch that the trout grows, right, it's going to gain 7.3 ounces. So for every additional inch of length a trout gains 7.3 ounces. Now, one last thing, even though it's not part of the problem, I never asked you to interpret the y-intercept here, right? Because honestly, the y-intercept here is a bit unrealistic. If you think about it right, the y-intercept 1.5 would be how many ounces a trout would weigh if it was zero inches in length. Now granted, 1.5 ounces is extremely light, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that if a trout was zero inches long, then it wouldn't weigh anything. All right, and yet the 1.5 is the y-intercept of our best fit line. It just doesn't really have any realistic interpretation. The slope still does. For every inch, an additional inch that the trout is long, it's going to be an additional 7.3 ounces in weight. All right, let's wrap this up. So today we mostly looked at how to interpret the slope and the y-intercept of a best fit linear model to a data set. We did look a little bit in exercise one, how to come up with the y-intercept, and also how to come up with the slope. 
But ultimately speaking, what we want to come out of today with is an ability to look at an equation of a best fit line and understand what the slope and the y-intercept are telling us about the scenario that we're looking at. We're going to look at that a little bit more in our final lesson on lines of best fit. But until then, I just want to thank you for joining me for another NGen Math 8 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until next time, keep thinking and keep solving problems.